Okay. So my name is Tracy Path Smith. I'm the executive director of the Huntington Historical Society. And I'm so glad that you've joined us today for our March virtual lunch and learn. Um, you may want to toggle a little bit if you're not seeing the, the uh, PowerPoint screen large and the speaker screen small, you can kind of toggle your view. Um, letting people in here to, to make sure you're seeing what you want to see. Um, we are going to be answering questions at the end, and those can be submitted throughout the presentation via that chat box that we've been using to communicate. And just make sure you're specific with your questions, please, because if you say, you know, what's happening in so-and-so picture, we get to the end, we're not going to remember which picture it was that you were referring to. Um, welcome to Stephen Santino, People's United Bank. Uh, so that is a great segue because if you'll change slides, Robert, we want to do a very special thank you to our sponsor of our virtual lunch and learns, People's United Bank. They were sponsoring our in-person ones and they very kindly kept their sponsorship up when we turned virtual. So thank you, Stephen, for joining us and thank you to People's United Bank for your support. We also want to thank everyone who made a donation when they signed up today. It's so, so appreciated now more than ever, as you can imagine. And thank you also to everyone on the presentation today who is a member of the Historical Society. We really, really appreciate your support. All right, if you'll move to the next one, Robert. Thank you. So we are coming back to life at the Historical Society. We have four events coming in April, which I'll describe very briefly and then we'll get started. We have started up our old burying ground tour, which is the cemetery right behind the Soldiers and Sailors building, that beautiful old building with the cannon in Huntington Village. That burying ground dates back to uh, the 1600s. So they, it's a walking tour that we do about once a month and those will start April 10th and they run in through November. So that's the information for that's gonna be on our website. Uh, Saturday, April 11th, we'll have two of our properties open for tours. This is the Soldiers and Sailors building uh, pictured here on the right, actually. That one will be open and our Conklin Farmhouse is gonna be open for tours Saturday, April 11th. Um, that's Sunday, April 11th, actually. Sorry about that. Um, our next virtual lunch and learn is going to be with Carly Wurzelbacher, who's the curator at the Heckscher Museum, and she's going to be talking about the Heckscher's 100-year history. They had their 100th anniversary of the founding of the museum last year, so she's going to be presenting about that, and there's going to be an exhibit opening in June, so it'll be sort of like a sneak preview for that, so that information will be on our website after today. And then in April 17th and 18th weekend, we're gonna be having our Antiques in April, which is our big outdoor antique sale. We'll have 17 antiques vendors from all across Long Island. The society has a barn sale going on and our antiques and collectible shop will be open. All right, so more information about that is gonna be on our website. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker, Robert Hughes. Robert is the Town of Huntington historian, and probably many of you have met or worked with him in the past, and if not, you've probably gotten to know him over these Lunch and Learns. So I will turn it over to Robert. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm gonna to speak today about the Irish in Huntington because it's March, um, and this is not intended to be a comprehensive overview because of course the Irish have been here for a long long time and it's a very complex um, history but I just wanted to touch on some of the early history and the early experiences and the highlights of, of the Irish experience here in the town of Huntington. Now it's really very difficult to say when the first Irish person came to Huntington um, and it's also sometimes a question of what do you what do you define as Irish? I think a lot of us who are thinking of the St. Patrick's Day Parade would be thinking of uh, Irish Catholics uh, from what is now the Republic. But you had the Scotch-Irish who came uh, to America even earlier than the Catholics, um, and they are considered Irish, at least by themselves. And uh, they may be some of them who settled in the Huntington area, uh, but those, those records are, would be very difficult to locate. I think it's, it's safe to say that the 
a bulk of the Irish that came to Huntington started in the 1840s. And the reason for that is, of course, the Great Hunger, the Irish potato famine of uh, the second half of the 1840s. This is the memorial in Dublin, uh, in the Docklands. Uh, and you can see it was uh, devastating for the Irish population. Uh, many, many starved to death and many others just left the country looking for a better life. And one of the places they came was to Huntington. Uh, we are fortunate that in terms of historical research, the um, arrival of the Irish coincides with a little more detail in the census records starting in 1850. Then you started to get lists of everybody in a family uh, and some occupations listed for the head of household. So we know a little bit more about who the people were. So in the 1850 census, which would be the first census after the, the potato famine, 325 residents of Huntington had been born in Ireland, which is 4.34% of the total population of the town. And that's the entire town, including what is now Babylon. The population of Huntington was about uh, 7,000 and something. So it was 4%. By 1860, the increase in the uh, percentage of the population of Irish born uh, increased 75% and became 6.32% of the total population of the town. The numbers are small, but the percentages are big. Now, what did those people do? Well, 72% of them were under the age of 30, so it was mostly young people. There were 11 uh, children born in Ireland who were not living with their families. They were living with some other family. And maybe that is because uh, their parents died during the potato famine or in the trip over, it's you know unclear, um, but certainly they, the personal impacts of the famine could be felt there. 40% of the men, the Irish men in 1850 in Huntington worked in the brickyards in West Neck. And in fact, 81% of all brickyard workers were Irish. The uh, immigrants would come into Castle Garden at the tip of Manhattan and we'd met by an agent of uh, the Crossman Brickyards and uh, he would offer them work in the brickyards and they would get on a steamship and come all the way to Lloyd Stock, which was a little north of where the uh, brickyards were. Um, and they would not only work at the brickyards, but live there. They would be provided a small shanty to live in with a garden to grow some vegetables. Usually they would have chickens to raise, sometimes a pig or a cow. Uh, and they'd shop at the company store. So it was really the typical company town, this little settlement. And the area of the brickyards, uh, the Crossman and Jones brickyards, is where the um, Lloyd Harbor Village Park is today. And we'll see some pictures of that. Not everyone, of course, worked in the brickyards. Uh, there were many who were farmhands uh, working in the outlying farms. A lot of women worked in different households as domestic servants. Five men were uh, ostlers or horse handlers uh, working on farms. Some of the more wealthy residents of Huntington had several uh, Irish servants. Uh, Churchill Chamberlain, who was one of the, who was a congressman and one of the founders of the modern Democratic Party with uh, Andrew Jackson. He had four Irish servants. Hiram Paulding, who was an admiral uh, in charge of the Brooklyn Navy Yard during uh, the Civil War had four servants. And John Rhinelander, who owned the big mansion on Keynes Lane in Huntington Bay, had six Irish uh, servants. So uh, it was a variety of people not in prosperous circumstances. Uh, they were, these were poor people ex escaping famine. So here the, here's a view of the brickyards. Um, it's actually looking across Cold Spring Harbor from Lloyd Harbor over to uh, Laurel Hollow. Here's a photograph of pretty much the same thing. You can see they would dig the clay out uh, to fire in the kilns and to make into bricks. This is the uh, remains of some docks that the boats would have come in uh, to pick up the uh, bricks and bring them into the New York City market. And this is one of those pits where they dug the clay. There are now two ponds up in uh, Lloyd Harbor Park. Uh, and those are the old pits that now filled in with rainwater. And you're not allowed to skate there. There are, you know, some of the Irish were killed working in these pits, digging clay as uh, the the ground collapsed. Uh, so it was a dangerous undertaking. Here's another view of those ponds. And this is what they made. They made bricks. Uh, they're simple bricks that were 
very important to the local uh, industry. Uh, we made millions of bricks every year here in the town of Huntington. And surprisingly, most of them were just shipped into the city. You find very few brick buildings in Huntington, certainly not uh, residences. Uh, the first brick building in the village was built in 1859. And we're gonna see a picture of that later on. Now, the arrival of the, the Irish in the 1840s and 50s predates the Civil War. And then uh, during the Civil War, the, um, the Union had to raise troops. And they were doing a variety of different methods at the beginning. They relied on volunteers. Volunteers would be paid a bounty, uh, but that was not enough. So eventually they instituted a draft in 1863. And this is a draft notice from uh, New Jersey. I couldn't find one from New York. But the draft was not popular, uh, especially among the working class, because if you were wealthy enough, you could buy your way out of the draft. Uh, you paid $300 and you could, uh, you could either send someone else in your place or just get out of uh, having to serve uh, on your own. $300, to put in perspective, a laborer, uh, such as the Irish who were working at the brickyards, would make about a dollar a day. So $300 is really a year's wages to get out of the draft. When they instituted the draft in July uh, of 1863 in uh, New York City, uh, riots erupted and really started initially with firemen, uh, but it spread to uh, the Irish being um, instrumental in protesting by rioting uh, against the draft. Uh, and it, it was open conflict on the streets um, Shops were burned, uh, black orphanages were burnt down, uh, stores were looted. It was just a, a pretty horrible scene. And people in Huntington uh, were reading about this in real time. They got the daily reports from New York City of what was going on. And they were very concerned that something similar might happen in Huntington Village because they had a large population not too far away up in uh, Lloyd Harbor. This is a picture of Amos Conklin, who was a young man who worked at the Samus Bakery uh, in 1863. He had a one-year-old daughter and another child on the way. He was also concerned about the draft and he did not want to serve. Um, he and a bunch of friends actually put together an insurance pool where they all put in $100 each. And if any of them were called up on the draft, they would use that pot of money to pay off, um, to pay to get their they're some themselves out of the draft. Three of them were called up, so they used that money and the, the little bit that was left over was returned uh, to everyone. So they ended up paying $82 each uh, to get out of the draft. And uh, a lot of the accounts we know about the agitation in Huntington Village and concern about uh, an Irish revolt here comes from Amos Conklin's diary. This is where he worked in the Samus Bakery, which was on the south side of Main Street, uh, near the corner of uh, Green Street. Uh, the building no longer exists. And this is uh, an entry from his diary, but everyone was very excited about the riots in the city. This is in the middle of the riots. He wrote this in his diary and concerned about the Irish attacking this village. The groups are standing on the corners discussing the events and everyone's going out looking for guns and pistols and even the old flintlocks just to defend themselves. One of the men who came from an outlying area was George Brush. And we know about uh, his activities from his wife, uh, Amelia's diary. And she said that George and some of his farmhands went up to the village to defend the brick building. And this is the brick building uh, Longtime residents may recognize this. It's on the corner of New Street and Main Street on the south side. Uh, this was the home to Reuben's luggage for many years. It was demolished some 15 years ago and is now uh, Wells Fargo Bank. But this was the brick building and we're kind of wondering why do they want to defend the brick building so much? The first brick building in the village. Well, it's not because it was brick apparently, but because it had a liquor store. And we think they probably figured the Irish in stereotypical way would go for the liquor store first, uh, which is just, you know, another example of prejudicial attitudes that uh, pervade American history. The Irish, of course, never attacked Huntington Village. 
Uh, there was never a draft riot here. They kept the peace. Uh, I did see a subsequent account. There may have been a bra bar brawl at one point in one of the uh, bars in town, but uh, that does not really rise to the level of a draft riot. That was just more of a, an altercation between people. But uh, right before the Civil War started, the, um, the Catholics in town decided that they wanted their own church. There had been the uh, Catholic masses in the house of Matthew Hoban, who lived on the north side of Main Street uh, between Sabbath Day Path and Park Avenue uh, in the Village Green area. Uh, he'd had masses at his house as early as 1838 with a circuit rider who had come out from Brooklyn to say masses in various locations on Long Island. In 1849, a church was built here on Huntington Road. Uh, this is now, of course, the location of St. Patrick's Cemetery. And the picture I'm showing you here is where the church was. The altar is here with uh, this uh, headstone, and we'll see who that is later on. Um, the church, unfortunately, um, burnt down later on. Uh, before I get to that, the, the first resident pastor was Jeremiah Crowley who came in 1860. He was an Irish immigrant, just like the people he was serving. He had uh, been ordained in Dublin in 1860 and immediately came to Huntington, uh, first to Bayshore and then to Huntington, uh, and served as a resident pastor here from 1860 to uh, 1895. Now he came, he was 25 years old, so he was young, but so were most of the Irish immigrants in his congregation. The church burnt down uh, on March 1st, 1867. Uh, the newspaper accounts attributed it to a faulty stovepipe, but Crowley disputed that. He said the stovepipe was installed correctly. There was no problem with the stovepipe. And he may have been remembering the year earlier on July 4th, 1866, there was an attempt to burn down his premises. Now, presuming he slept or uh, lived in the church building itself, when he talked about his premises, he was talking about the church building. So there had been an arson attempt against the church. Uh, in 1866, and then it did burn down in 67. So there is some uh, reason to suspect that it was arson. Uh, the church decided to rebuild, but not in this location. This is Crowley's monument. This is where the altar of the old church was. They decided to rebuild not up in the, the woods of West Neck, but down on Main Street in the village. The, Crowley bought an acre of land and they built this church. Uh, in 1867, started, laid the cornerstone in uh, Thanksgiving, 1867, and it was consecrated in 1869. And not surprisingly, it was built of bricks because the Irish were brickyard workers. So uh, what better material to use than bricks to build this wonderful church? It seated 500. Um, it was a very attractive church inside and out. As you can see, the stone walls uh, here were added in the 1890s, and they still survive today. The church itself is now a parking lot. As the uh, congregation grew and grew over the years, uh, it outgrew that small church, and the larger current church was built uh, in 1963. Both churches existed for about six years, and then shortly after the 100th anniversary of the old church, it was torn down, which is a real shame. Uh, it would be nice if that had survived, like the old church at St. Dominic's in Oyster Bay, which is uh, used for special occasions like weddings uh, and baptisms instead of just the regular weekly mass. It would have been nice if we'd done that here in Huntington, but obviously we needed the parking lot as well. As you can see, it's quite full. Those same, uh, stone walls were built up at the cemetery in the old location of the church. And these would have been steps leading up to that, uh, where the church was, but they are after the fact, after the church had burnt down, these, these uh, pillar, these piers were built. And some people took some interest in this a few years ago and were agitating for uh, the, the steps to be landmarked or in some way restored and fixed up. And the church was Seemed a little hesitant at first, uh, I don't know why, but eventually the church did re restore them and now they're in very good condition and there's a nice uh, fence there instead of the chain link fence that used to be there and a gate that you can walk in, although not too many people are walking on Huntington Road because there's no sidewalks there. 
The cemetery was expanded in the 1890s. Additional land was purchased. And here's uh, the grave of uh, Mary, the daughter of Matthew Hoban, who hosted the first uh, masses, and Margaret, his wife. An interesting thing about these graves, uh, markers, which I've never really noticed anywhere else, certainly not in the colonial uh, graves that Huntington has scattered throughout, is the, the wording. Uh, they always say, who paid for the marker? So this one is Daniel Meehan is buried here, but it was the marker was erected by Catherine Meehan. There's another one uh, in memory of John Noland by his three sons. And you see at the bottom, it says he's a native of, uh, I can't quite read what that says, but the parish in Ireland where he came from. And here's another one that says he's a native of Wineport uh, County, Westmeath, Ireland. That's something else you usually don't see in other cemeteries in town, uh, indicating where the person was, came from. But uh, the Irish uh, graves in this older section of St. Patrick's almost all have that indication of, of where the person had come from. After Father Crowley uh, left St. Pat's, the pastor was Father York, who can be seen here on the steps of the rectory. There's Father York, and there's Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Father York uh, struck up uh, quite a friendship. Uh, Teddy, of course, lived right next door in Oyster Bay, and he would often visit uh, Huntington and, and stop and chat with Father York. Uh, Father York was very popular in town, even though it was still very much a Protestant town in the 1890s and early 20th century. He was involved in a lot of the civic affairs of the town when they had big events uh, and parades. He was invariably there. He uh, later went on to uh, serve, I think, in Brooklyn. And York Hall at the Kings Park Psychiatric Center is named in his honor. Uh, by uh, 1933, the Irish American Social Club had been formed to promote you know, Irish education and culture. Uh, and a couple of years later in 1935, they started hosting a parade in Main Street. They would start down in the station, up in the station on uh, New York Avenue and Depot Road and march down to uh, High Street and then over to Woodbury Road, up to Main Street and across east on Main Street, which is different than what they do today and the reviewing stand would be by the Soldiers and Sailors building, which at that time was the library. So here we see uh, Main Street from New York Avenue, which is over here, heading towards Old Town Hall. And that's why the, they're all walking in the, the wrong direction, it seems. And of course, they had uh, the Irish band and the drums. The night before the big parade, there was always a, uh, a ball. This is at the Hotel Huntington. They sometimes uh, had the ball at Oddfellows Hall on Wall Street, uh, later at uh, ho the Hotel Huntington. Uh, and that tradition continues today with the Grand Marshal's Ball. Here's the reviewing stand set up on Main Street. And here are those uh, young women we saw before. As you can see, I, I put this presentation together about nine years ago. So all these girls are, are probably now in high school. I don't think they're quite in college, but they're older than they are now. And uh, bagpipes, of course, are always in, in every parade. Uh, and you can see that in nine years, the town of Huntington has changed a bit. That big white building is no longer there. It's been replaced by TD Bank. And of course, although they have nothing to do with the Irish, no parade is complete without the Huntington militia. Here they are firing their muskets. Now, a big part of the uh, story of the Irish in uh, Huntington is Finnegan's. That's what everyone remembers, and a few people have mentioned that uh, even today uh, while we were waiting to start about how they always uh, came to Finnegan's. And Finnegan's has a rich, long history in the town of Huntington. It's, uh, at the time this picture was taken, it was almost 100 years. So now it's close, getting close to uh, 108 years in the town of Huntington. And uh, I think I put this out of order. I do have a picture of Andrew Finnegan, who was the, the founder uh, of Finnegan's Tap Room. Andrew was an Irish immigrant. He was born in 1876, same year as my grandfather. He came over to uh, New York as a young man. He first settled in Great Neck, where he worked for his uncle, who had a blacksmith shop. It was difficult work, 
hot, sweaty work, 14 hour days, and he would get room and board. And he uh, eventually decided there must be an easier, better way to make a living than being a blacksmith's apprentice. He went into New York City and became a barman's uh, bartender's helper at a bar in Manhattan, eventually opened his own bar uh, on 48th Street um, and later ran the, uh, oh, I forget the name of the club now, but a club for uh, Charles Murphy, who was the head of Tammany Hall, a uh, social club down on 20th Street and 2nd Avenue. And then in 1913, he, uh, I guess, in a semi-retirement came out to Huntington and took over operation of the Huntington House. The Huntington House, which you can see here, dates to about uh, 1816. Um, it had been a general store previous to becoming an inn. Um, then it became an inn run by Samuel Scudder for many years and had a variety of owners and a variety of uh, proprietors over the year. Over the years, they were going to close it in 18, 1912, uh, but then uh, Andrew Finnegan showed up and, and agreed to operate it. So he took over in March of 1913 and operated uh, the Huntington House as a hotel and uh, saloon. Unfortunately, six years later, prohibition was passed. So in 1919, uh, the owners decided, well, we have to close down. Uh, and the building was demolished in 1920 after all the fixtures and lumber and everything were, were auctioned off. Uh, Finnegan, Andrew Finnegan went on to run, uh, manage a bowling alley in Huntington Station and later the York Hotel on New York Avenue, which is now Pancho Villas. Here's a picture of Andrew off in the corner uh, in front of his hotel. Not a very good picture of him, but there he is. This is a better picture of him uh, inside uh, Finnegan's uh, today. After the uh, Hotel Huntington was demolished, new stores were built along Main Street by 1922, and stores along uh, Wall Street were added um, later in the 20s. I don't have a definitive date, but certainly by 1925, when uh, Andrew's wife, uh, Eleanor, purchased the store on the end here and opened a restaurant. This was still during Prohibition, so uh, they did not have these signs that said wine and liquors, and the Rheingold beer next door uh, was not there. This Rheingold pick, uh, building was not part of Finnegan's. This was a separate restaurant. Finnegan's was just this part here. This building with, has the Rheingold sign. This is obviously taken after Prohibition was repealed in 1933. Was uh, during Prohibition a furniture store, or at least it seemed to be a furniture store. In the back behind the furniture showroom was a fully stocked bar. And there's a detailed account of a, a raid uh, in the, during the height of Prohibition where they shut down that, um, uh, that bar. They had an informant who went in and uh, ascertained and confirmed that there was indeed a bar there. And then the uh, revenue agents went in and closed it down. They left the informant out in the car. Uh, seeing this car parked on the street here kind of reminds me of that. Uh, and uh, the crowd found out what was going on. They came and beat him up and disabled the car. So it was not a good, good way to treat your uh, informant. But Finnegan's, of course, after Prohibition was able to open um, as, a, as a bar, as well as a restaurant. It is said that the uh, first day after Prohibition, the Irish went to Finnegan's and the Italians went to uh, Valencia Tavern at the other end of uh, Wall Street. So everyone had their, their place to go. Finnegan celebrated its uh, centennial uh, in 2012, uh, technically a year early uh, because he, Andrew Finnegan didn't take over until uh, March of 1913, um, but that was an occasion to do something with this mural. This mural was added by Philip Jordan in 1978 on the, uh, the side, the uh, plain concrete wall on the side of Finnegan's in the alley. Um, his brother was a bartender at Finnegan's and uh, Philip had just graduated from the Kansas City Institute of Art and he thought that it would be uh, nice to, to come up with a public art project I guess, to promote himself as, as well as anything else. And he asked his brother if he thought the owners would mind if he painted this mural. 
and they did not mind. So he took Polaroid pictures of all the regulars uh, and then went and painted them onto this mural. And it was pretty much intact for, uh, uh, well, since 1978 until 2012. The only graffiti that I am aware of, we see right here, it says two plus two equals five. So either a not a very intelligent uh, graffiti artist or someone trying to make a point. Uh, so for the Centennial, uh, Philip came back and repainted it. And you can see now it's much more vibrant than it had been. It did fade over the years. He used special paint to try to get it back to its uh, original vibrancy. Uh, there's a few people we could point out in here. Um, well, here's that picture of Andrew that I showed you before. Here is the Huntington House. Here's the clock stuck at 11 in honor of the armistice. Uh, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in uh, 1918, it's the end of World War I. I would presume that that clock probably comes from the Huntington House and uh, the Finnegan family saved it to put it back up uh, in the bar. So it's always at 11. Here is William Finnegan down here who continued to tend bar even after the Finnegan family sold the bar uh, in the 1970s. When uh, Philip Jordan repainted this uh, mural in uh, 2012, he added two people. And one of the people he added is right here is Tom Fort, who is now the manager of Finnegan's. Uh, at the time this was painted in 1978, he was working at the Sportsman's Bar at the Bowling Alley, which is now Stop and Shop. Uh, but he added him uh, the way he looked, would have looked in 1978 to this mural. The other person he added uh, was Harry Chapin. I don't know if I have a picture, if he shows up on the picture earlier. Yeah, he's, he's up here above the door. Can't really see it. Uh, in, real in real life, you can see it. So he added H Harry Chapin as well. Uh, Philip is peeking in the window holding a paintbrush. And I think Tim Finnegan is in here who's listening in right now and he can straighten me out on some of these facts. I think he's in here as well. Uh, this is a picture of Rufus Lyons, who was the town historian in 1978. Originally, when this was painted, he was holding up the Huntington Declaration of Rights from 1774. But for the restoration, he's now holding, holding up a copy of the Long Islander, talking about the centennial and the restoration of the mural. And here is William Finnegan, Andrew's son, who continued to tend bar. And of course, back to the uh, parade and bagpipes. When I first gave this talk, we did it at the Huntington Social. Uh, so I included this photograph then so people could see Huntington Social. And now, of course, you see the change of times. Huntington Social no longer exists. I think the restaurant that replaced it may have closed as well. Uh, so things continually change. But the, uh, the Irish continue to thrive here in the town of Huntington. And this was a little shorter presentation than you're maybe used to, but I think I left enough time for lots of questions. So I hope people do have questions. Um, and if they're in the chat, maybe Tracy could help me in answering some of them. All right, thank you so much, Robert. I don't see any questions yet. If anyone has any questions and you would like to put them in the chat, um, please feel free. I, I have a question actually, um, which you may yes. not be able to answer because it's a sort of a <laughs> big question, but the idea of doing the insurance pool to get out of the draft, was yes. that commonly done? What a clever idea. Uh, I don't know how common it was, but certainly they did it here in the town of Huntington. They had, I think, a, uh, 10 or 12 uh, men uh, who participated. And as I said, only three of them were drafted. So they made out very well. They only paid $82 instead of 300 uh, and got to stay out of the draft. Uh, and the others only lost $82, but it was probably worth it to help out their friends. Yeah, that was, that was very good thinking, whoever's plan that was. Um, all right, Priscilla asks, the mural looks like it's on a brick wall. Is that a brick building? Interestingly, it is, um, am I still sharing? No, it looks like it's gone. Oh, okay, I want to share again. 
that is that was a plain concrete wall and the um the artist painted those bricks on so it looks like brick but it's all just paint Uh, the front is actual brick, but the uh, the side where the mural is is all painted on. So it's just kind of a concrete surface. Yeah, these bricks are paint. Wow. And the bricks down here. That's uh, just a paint job. Is Philip the artist still local? Do we know? Uh, I believe so. Yes, he, he also did the, the sign above book review and uh, Mondays. Oh, interesting. He's a Huntington legend. Yes. Uh, Peter asks, I missed which building was the oldest brick building? It is the former Rubens building. Um, it's, it was demolished about 15 years ago. It was on the southwest corner of Main Street and New Street. Okay. Uh, Ed and Peggy ask, who is the most influential Irishman from Huntington besides those mentioned earlier? That'd be hard to say. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm welcoming nominations, but I, I think it's impossible to say who was the most influential. Influential. Depends on what you mean. Uh, political leaders or Irish political leaders or certainly church leaders from uh, St. Patrick's and other parishes. Um, and of course, everyone's a little Irish, so. <laughs> Especially in March. Yes, we wouldn't want to narrow it down. All right. Um, do you know the first burial in St. Patrick's on Huntington Road? I don't have that, uh, that information. We could, uh, we could look that up. Okay, yeah, that's a good question, I wonder. And it, of course, we, you know, I don't know what the record's like uh, at the cemetery office. What we would have is maybe the earliest headstone, but there could be burials predating the headstones that have survived till today. Uh, so, but probably sometime in the 1840s or 1850s, they purchased the land in 1849. And those records are held by the church? Yes. Okay. I have to do some research. Um, Peter asks, how early did the railroad from New York City arrive? Uh, 1867. Uh, it was originally uh, intended to reach from uh, Brooklyn to uh, Orient Point where people would get the, or Greenport, where people would get the ferry uh, across to um, Connecticut and on to Boston. It was meant as a cargo shortcut to avoid going through the hills of Connecticut. Uh, so it didn't serve the towns on the North Shore or the South Shore. It was extended to Syosset in 1854 and then to Huntington in 1867. All right. Um, Adrian asks, why did Reverend Crowley feel people wanted to burn him out? I didn't get a chance to interview Reverend Crowley, but I would imagine there was, as we could see from the draft riot, uh, talk in the town of Huntington, there was probably a lot of anti-Irish and anti-Catholic sentiment within the town of Huntington. Uh, and I, you know, the, the same people who would have thought the Irish were gonna attack the village and they had to defend it with guns on every corner were probably happy or would have liked to have seen the Irish leave. Um, and so burning down their church was probably something that they did. I mean, it's another example of, of prejudicial behavior by a, the new, against the newcomers. Um, who are now well established and part of the community, but they had a troubled history, just like a lot of other uh, groups that were that are newcomers. Okay, John asks, Emos, question mark, Conklin part of the same family as the restaurant Abel Conklin's? There are so many Conklin's all over, not just Huntington, but Long Island, because they've been here for over 350 years. So they are all probably related in some way or another. How closely, I couldn't say. Uh, we do have a very good genealogy of the Conklin family in the archives, but it'll probably take a, quite a while to look that up and see exactly how closely related they are. Abel Conklin, um, 
I, I'm not sure exactly how, why they picked the name Able Conference. I think Abel was an early owner of that building. He had nothing to do with the restaurant, of course, and he would be much earlier than uh, Emos. So, um, Amos. Um, but there, there probably is some kind of relationship, cousins, but probably not direct. Mm. All right, Bruce asks, was Jimmy Walker Irish? I believe so. And Jimmy Walker, of course, was the mayor of New York City. He also had a summer home in Ashrokan, um, but a, a, not a great connection to Huntington, but uh, he certainly spent time here. We'll take it, <laughs> we'll count it. <laughs> All right, Kathy asks, were any Irish Huntington citizens, were any Irish Huntington citizens who fought in the Civil War? So I guess were any of them known to be Irish? Yeah, I'm sure there were. We'd have to look at the uh, the enlistment records. And it's, you could be from Huntington, but enlist in a unit from some other town and you would be credited to that town. Plenty of people who were listed as Huntington, uh, part of the Huntington regiments, were actually from other places. Uh, it kind of depended on who you signed up with. But I'm sure there were plenty of uh, Irish uh, Huntingtonians who fought in the Civil War. You could probably look at some of the names and discern. All right, Priscilla asks, was the fire at the church linked to the founding of the Hibernian chapter in Huntington? The Hibernians were established uh, in the first half of the 19th century in New York City to defend uh, the Catholic churches, but particularly the original St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, downtown. Um, and they evolved from that into a social organization. In Huntington, they were not established until after the Irish American Social Club, uh, which was in the 1930s. The Hibernians started later on uh, in Huntington, uh, their division for the Suffolk County Hibernians. So they are not directly related to that fire. Uh, they came much later. Uh, the Hibernians eventually took over uh, organization of the parade. Um, uh, and, and I should have noted that uh, in from 1942 to 1945, uh, there was no parade because of World War II. Mm. Uh, and then it resumed the year after, which makes the numbering of how many parades there have been questionable because uh, you have those three years missing. And of course, the last big event in town before the pandemic was the St. Patrick's Day Parade last year, um, which some people were blaming for spreading the spread of the pandemic. I don't know how true that is. Uh, but this year, again, we didn't have a parade in person, but the Hibernians did have a virtual parade up at the Seminary of the Immaculate Conception. So I think in some ways we can say that the, the string of uh, consecutive parades has continued. All right. Uh, Marie asks, was there anything in particular that drew Irish immigrants to the Huntington area? Jobs. Uh, they were met uh, at the uh, docks in Manhattan at the Immigration Center in Castle Garden and offered jobs if they came to Huntington. So I'm sure that's how a lot of them got here. Um, even the ones who didn't go to the brickyards found out about jobs from relatives or friends who had come here. Uh, and they had uh, found work as domestics and farm laborers. So it's, you know, typical of why anyone goes to any place. It's typically because there are jobs there. Mm. Okay, that was a good question. Hillary says, Northport Running Club used to have a traditional run and meet at Finnegan's Bar to wait for the parade to start. Many didn't make the parade. <laughs> well, fortunately for them, the parade always comes to Finnegan's. At the end of the parade, there are plenty of bagpipers inside Finnegan's. So. They, they didn't miss it all together. They didn't miss it. <laughs> That's funny, Hillary. Um, uh, Peter said, some joined fighting Irish 69th. I guess that was about the Civil War. The Irish practice. soldiers, yes. 69, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, Bruce asks, was St. Patrick's Church in Smithtown burned because they were Irish? I am not familiar with the, the church in Smithtown and what happened there. Uh, so I couldn't say. Uh, we'll have to ask somebody from Smithtown, Bruce. Okay, and then we have our archivist, Karen Martin, um, is on and she's writing to me privately. She says, in the archives, we have copies of records from St. Patrick's Church, birth, marriage, death, etc. 
Also in 1990, the genealogy workshop mapped, sketched, and transcribed the early stones in St. Patrick's Cemetery. So we have good records, it sounds like, in the archives. So maybe we can go in and, and find the answer to who's the earliest burial that way. Thank you, Karen. Um, so it looks like she, she then further was looking into it. Earliest internment on these stones that was transcribed was a child of 18 months who died August 1849. The earliest adult internment was August of 19, 1950, is that right, Karen? 1850. Yeah, it must be 1850. 1850. Okay. Yeah, so shortly after they purchased the land for the church, uh, burials started. And prior to that, um, I, I, it's hard to say where they would have been buried, probably in the old burying ground, although I can't think of any uh, Irish names there. Uh, they may not have had marked graves. Huntington Rural Cemetery didn't come into existence until uh, 1851, and the first burial was 1853. So I'm sure there were Irish people who died uh, in that period before uh, 49, and they must be buried somewhere. Yeah, must be somewhere. Um, Karen said that the stones often mentioned where in Ireland they came from. So that's interesting. So that would be really good for genealogy research. Um, Peter says, thank you for the excellent presentation. And I think it was John and Grace. Um, so thank you, Karen. You've significantly helped me over the years with family research. Thanks for that, John. That's lovely. All right, are there any other questions? Uh, I see Bruce noted 1922, but I'm not sure what that was in reference that's, that's to. That's the fire at St. Patrick's in Spain. The fire. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, any other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat. And if not, then we're gonna, we're gonna close up. Robert Hughes has a blog. If anybody's interested in following his blog, would you tell us that, it was on that last slide, Robert, but would you tell us what the address for that is? Huntingtonhistory.com. And there's an entry there on the Irish in Huntington, which uh, if you listen to this presentation will sound very familiar because that's a lot of the same history. <laughs> a lot of that. All right, so you can do a recap on there if you'd like. And we're also going to send out to everybody who registered, I'll send the copy of this recording so that you have it. And we put all of the past recordings on our website, which is huntingtonhistoricalsociety.org, O-R-G. Um, so I'll, I'll include a link of that too, if there were any past presentations that you missed and would like to see. And this one will be on there as well, as well as information on our next Lunch and Learn, the one about the Heckscher Museum. So thank you everyone so, so much for joining us. Thank you, Robert, for your sharing your time and expertise. Um, and thank you to all those who joined locally and from far away. We're so happy to have you and to share some of Huntington's history with you. So we'll see you next time. Everyone be safe, take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.